Hi, my name is John Freeman. I am an executive editor at Alfred A. Knopf, and it is my great pleasure to be joined today by Tay Tibble, who's come all the way from Wellington, New Zealand, for the World Voices Festival of Penn to give some readings and is going to talk to us today about her poems. Welcome. Namahi <laughs> Dawa. Oh, thank you. Tay, these poems, as you remarked the other day, were written in your early 20s, uh, which you are still almost in. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about what was on, going on in your mind at the time? What was the kind of artistic concerns that you thought needed to be worked out in these particular poems? Well, at the time I was actually uh, studying my degree of creative writing at the International Institute of Modern Letters uh, in Wellington. And I was writing this, this manuscript as part of my MA uh, program. And I think basically at the time, like, um, I was really encouraged to just write in this direction. I hadn't really written very much about what I write about in this book, which is like indigeneity, culture, and my, and my family, and fuck up up and my ancestry. Um, I hadn't really written anything about those subjects before. Um, and then as soon as I started writing about that in the class, I, I immediately had like a really strong reaction from everyone that this is the type of work I should have been doing, and that this is the work I should uh, pursue for this book. Um, and at the time, yeah, it was. It seemed important because there weren't many uh, young uh, rangatahi Māori or young Māori writing about their experiences uh, in New Zealand literature and publishing. Mm. Yeah, your grandmother, uh, your brother, various family members all come into the sort of weave of this book, uh, but also mythologies of Kiwi life, of being a woman, uh, Medusa, um, and of course, Pocahontas of the title, who is a, a real um, indigenous woman in this country, but also uh, in the Disney film, which was released the year you were born. Can you tell me a little bit about that weave and, and why you're sort of moving in and out of those various mythologies and, and what the combination of them allows you to do? I think first and foremost, it's just very like natural to me. Like I just exist at this intersection of, of my culture, of my indigeneity and also of modernity and, and pop culture and all these other references that, that, that I've grown up with being just like a citizen <laughs> of the globalised world. Um, so yeah, it's just very natural to me, but also I really like the artistic tension that it creates as well, when these kind of different uh, figures or uh, uh, references like meet each other and rub up against each other, I feel like that there's like a natural tension. And, and one of the favourite uh, like bits of advice I ever got about writing poetry um, so that's New Zealand poet uh, Apirana Taylor who said, like, you want to make words or images uh, meet on the page that have never met before. And it's just like, yeah, makes it easier when you have like a diverse pool of references to draw from. Mm, yeah, I mean, there are lines, I wear my aviators in the club, um, all the way to some of the um, Maori myths that, that um, uh, and beliefs that make up your family and your worldview. And, and you were telling me the other day that different indigenous people uh, in New Zealand have different myths for how, or different beliefs for how their people got to the island. What does that mean for you as a poet when you have to sort of write towards or into a, a kind of plurality of stories that way? Um, it's, it's definitely interesting and, and it can actually be a difficult thing to navigate, like um, what stories are actually mine to tell, what, what stories I can tell, what stories actually belong to other people. Are there iwi in New Zealand um, who actually fuck a papa to certain figures? Like, for example, like one of my favourite mythological figures, or mythological <laughs> being the, the um, you know, one way to describe it, is, is this figure of Panya, uh, Panya of the Reef, who I do write kind of reference in, in this book, in this poem called Panya. And she... Um, but she actually doesn't belong to my iwi, she belongs to Nahi, Nati Kahanunu. Mm. Um, but I relate to her so much because she was like one of the, one of the figures that we grew up uh, learning about in our schools. And Myth both is and isn't the right word for some of the stories you're telling and some of the figures that you're talking about. And what would be the word you would use and why? I think creation stories. Um, what about mythology r refers to how the world came to be and as a way to explain that through the personification of natural elements in the forms of gods and demigods. In a way, I feel like this book is your creation story. Can you talk about making that kind of book? Sure, I think, I think this book is 
Yeah, it's like a creation story and it's definitely like a narrative of reclamation. Like there, this is definitely a story and these are definitely poems set in a sort of an urban Māori space. So after like World War II especially, um, lots of Māori moved away from their papakainga or their ancestral lands, the rural lands, to go and work and make a living uh, in the city. And this is also because of the impoverishment that just went rampant throughout the country following colonisation and the continual like uh, crown acclamation of our land. So these, these, these natives had to move into these city areas and, and just and as a kind of result of that there has been like great disconnection um, for, the, for Māori living in these centres. It's not natural for us to live away from our, from our land, from our mountains, from our rivers. Um, but also at the same time, I feel like this book was trying to explore that idea, that those themes and that kind of feelings and the, and the consequences of this uh, dislocation, while also kind of kind, trying to also go into you know, the understanding that you're still Māori if you're away from these centres, and then and now there's like a new way of being Māori uh, in, the, in these urban centres. Mm. Reminds me a lot of, of some of the things that Tommy Orange is working out in his novel, There, There. Just in the past week, you've spent some time in New York. We're in the United States right now in the offices of Knopf at Penn World Voices, talking with some other indigenous writers from North America, Tanya Talaga, who's in Canada, Connie Walker, um, and uh, Deborah Taffa, who's the director of the Creative Writing Program um, of the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. Um, is there anything that you've noticed in those conversations that you share in common or anything that's different? It's incredible. The thing that always strikes me the most is the similarity, like, um, you know, like just the world view is so the same, like so it can, it's the, all, all the things that are the most important are the same, the land, the people, the stories, the storytelling. Um, but yeah, it's been super awesome being able to connect like last week with Tanya and um, Deborah and Connie um, because it's heartening too, because I know that the struggles that we're having in Aotearoa uh, with our indigenous population, it's the same everywhere. You know, indigenous people, we're the original kaitiaki or guardians of, of, of the land and um, we know the best way to, to nurture and, and maintain that relationship with the land and like, I feel like that's like literally the most pressing thing and I just always, always see this hideous and also profound connection between the desecration and the disrespect towards an indigenous woman and that with the earth mm. and the climate. Pocahontas is the first of two books we're publishing by you. Uh, the second, Rangakura, uh, came out recently in New Zealand and it will be out here in a year or two. Can you tell us just briefly what, what you think might be the difference between that book um, and your first, Pocahontas? Do you feel uh, there's been a development that you can notice yourself? Yeah, I definitely do. I think this first book, Pocahontas, was yeah, really set in that urban Māori experience where you're searching for connection and searching for your ancestors and wondering if you're, you know, um, moving about Māori tanga in the correct and tika way. Whereas the second book's a lot more confident uh, and knows that the tūpuna uh, are, are there. Uh, and I also think that the, the, the first book is very New Zealand in tone. It's got a very direct and... Uh, kind of simple uh, a tone. And I think the second book's kind of more American. Mm. Um, and it's still like the books that I was reading as I was writing it. Well, do you think you could read a poem or two for us from, from Pocahontas? Sure. Our Nan lets us smoke inside. Our Nan lets us smoke inside, but only when we drink wine and play cards on the kitchen table. I feel glamorous when I drop my ash into the power shell in the middle. Our nan wears black leather pumps and dries wishbones from chicken carcasses in an empty margarine container on top of the fridge. She's not my real nan, but I have always wished she was. I wished I was born with her. Blood in my veins, her dark Waikato DNA, high cheekbones and heavy wet eyes just like my sister. Our nan met her late husband in the late 60s. She was dressed in a little mod dress, her black hair flat. And he was a cowboy with mutton chops and tan line legs and short cream shorts who rode off to work every morning with a commercial digger for a horse butt. 
He'd pick us up in his station wagon on Sundays, Johnny Cash and his metronome voice making us fall asleep against the dusty windows so we would stop for a filet of fish and a strawberry milkshake for lunch and for dinner. But he always picked my sister up more. At his funeral, us girls carried the mismatched flowers behind our brothers in black sunglasses. At the service, we all got up and sang, I hope you're dancing in the sky. But it was painful and flat and sounded like coughing. During the burial, nobody exhaled a word as my nan ashed out a half-sucked cigarette in the fresh, sour soil. And in the car park, we all smoked back tears with another cigarette pacifier like babies numbed on a nicotine nipple. Hawaii. My mother, tired from pregnancy and being alive, named her last son Hawaii, like the paradise. Some people say it is where we go when we die. They say we dive straight off the edge of Cape Reinga and into the point where the sky hangs so heavy with spirits that it touches the sea. Other people say that that is where we were before we came here by waka or whale, or perhaps that was where we were before there was anything at all, where we meant something before we discovered, like Eve, God's forbidden fruit in the shape of an eye. I think it must be a womb where everything is born and returns to, Life and death are the colour of red. They are the colour of a cosmic heartbeat rising on his fresh baby flesh, pinched between fingers and kissed.